In this lecture, we'll have an introduction to two new functional groups, the aldehyde functional group and the ketone functional group. Aldehydes and ketones are closely related to each other in many ways, but most fundamentally because they're very similar in structure. Both aldehydes and ketones are based on a carbonyl bond. We've already seen that a carbonyl bond simply means a carbon double bonded to an oxygen. That means that the carbon can also have other bonds attached, and in the case of aldehydes and ketones, that will be two other single bonds. Now what's attached to those single bonds is what dictates whether we're looking at an aldehyde or a ketone. In the case of an aldehyde, we'll have a carbonyl bond that has at least one hydrogen directly connected to the carbon. The other side of the bond can be either an R group, whether a methyl, ethyl, or something more complex, or it can be another hydrogen. So all aldehydes have a carbonyl bond with a hydrogen directly attached to the carbon. Ketones, on the other hand, will have a carbonyl bond in which there are no hydrogens attached. Instead, there are two R groups. And again, these R groups can be very simple, like a methyl or an ethyl, or they can be more complex. As a result of this, we often think of ketones as being in the middle of a backbone of carbons, whereas aldehydes are usually at the end. One more note about aldehydes and ketones. We'll see a lot of different ways to write them, and you will occasionally run into the shorthand way of writing aldehydes, which is to see them written as CHO. This is the condensed form of writing an aldehyde, and it's meant to represent a carbon that's single bonded to the hydrogen and double bonded to the oxygen. To be honest, I don't really like writing it this way because I think it's easy to confuse it with some other type of structure, but you may run into it occasionally. Now physically, aldehydes and ketones are very similar to each other, and they're also similar to other functional groups we've looked at, such as alcohols and ethers. And the reason for that is, just like alcohols and ethers, they contain the polar carbon to oxygen bond. Because of this, aldehydes and ketones tend to be polar molecules. And as we've seen when we talked about ethers, while we didn't go into it in great detail, these are not molecules which are capable of hydrogen bonding with themselves, but they can interact with other hydrogen bonding molecules. Probably the most important thing to remember is that while these are polar molecules, the more carbons that they contain, the less they really act like that. So aldehydes and ketones can be soluble in water if they don't contain many carbons, while if they do, they may be more soluble in organic solvents. It's just a general rule, but it's good to keep in mind. Let's look in more detail at aldehydes first and then at ketones. Aldehydes, as we already saw, are molecules in which we have a carbonyl bond with at least one hydrogen directly attached to the carbon. Naming them as a result is very easy because they tend to always occupy the same place on a carbon backbone or carbon chain. For this reason, when we name them, we'll start, like we always start our IUPAC naming, by naming the chain. And as we've seen before, we need to make sure we include the functional group when we do name the chain. Now we're going to learn the new ending that we use for aldehyde molecules, and that ending is the AL ending. Don't confuse it with the OL ending that we would use for alcohols. And you'll note that this is one reason it's important that we're clear both in speaking and writing the names of these molecules. You'll notice that because aldehydes have at least one hydrogen directly bonded to the carbon, they're always going to be at the beginning or the end of a chain. And for that reason, we can state the following rule. Aldehyde functional groups are always automatically placed at carbon number one in a chain. That means two things. One, you don't have a choice of whether to number from the left side or the right side when naming. You just have to start at the carbonyl carbon. And two, it means that we don't need to specify the location of the aldehyde. Let's try an example. Take a second and pause the video to see if you can name this aldehyde. 
As we already said, the carbonyl carbon in an aldehyde will always be designated as carbon number one. That means this carbon is number one, and I'll number the rest of the chain starting from there. Here's carbon two, three, four, five, and six. I have a total of six carbons, which means the name of this molecule will be hexanal. Notice that I don't need to use any numbering to designate the location of the carbonyl bond, because the fact that it's an aldehyde, as indicated by the AL ending, means that that carbonyl bond must be on whatever carbon is number one. Try this example. To number the backbone chain, I always designate the carbonyl carbon as carbon number one. That means that I have a total of four carbons in the backbone chain, but I also have an additional carbon, making this a methyl substituent, or methyl branch. To put together the name of this molecule, I'll recognize that the base part of the name four carbons in an aldehyde will be butanal, but I also have a branch. So to designate that branch, I'll put it in the front of the name the same way I would with any other type of functional group. So this molecule is called 3-methylbutanal. Be careful to always number the carbonyl carbon as carbon number one. Sometimes it's easy to overlook it and just skip it by accident. Aldehydes show up in virtually every area of chemistry you can study, from industrial science to the environment to the human body. And because of that, some of the simplest aldehydes, which are very common, actually go more frequently by their common names than their IUPAC names. Let me show you a couple examples that you should be aware of. I'll start by putting up the structure and see if you can tell me what the IUPAC name would be of this molecule. This very common aldehyde contains just one carbon, so we would use the prefix meth, meaning that it would have the IUPAC name methanal. However, you'll very rarely hear this compound referred to as methanal. Instead, it goes by its common name, formaldehyde, which you've probably heard of. Formaldehyde might be most well known for a purpose that it's actually not widely used for anymore and that is that it used to be used as a preservative. So, quite infamously, if you wanted to preserve something like a human brain or an animal specimen, you might soak it in a jar of formaldehyde. We don't do that much anymore for a reason I'll tell you in a moment. Instead, what formaldehyde is really commonly used for these days is as an ingredient in organic synthesis and as a curing agent in certain types of resins or glues. In fact, it's used a lot in different types of building materials, especially things like plywood and fiberboard, which have to be glued and pressed together. Now, there's some concern about the use of formaldehyde in these purposes, and it's actually because of the same reason that we no longer use it as a preservative. Formaldehyde is a known carcinogen. It's a compound that's known to cause cancer, both in lab animals and in humans. That's why we don't like to use it as a preservative, because while it won't damage the already dead specimen, it can be dangerous for the people that work with it. Also, the formaldehyde that's used as a curing agent can off-gas or vaporize over time. And in fact, this is something that causes what's called indoor air pollution, and it's becoming more tightly regulated the more people become aware of it. It's a really fascinating topic to look into more. Let's look at a couple other common aldehydes. Methanal, or formaldehyde, is the simplest aldehyde. The second simplest aldehyde in terms of carbon content is this molecule. What would the IUPAC name be for this molecule? Because this molecule contains two carbons, this is what would be called ethanol. But again, it more commonly goes by its common name, which is called acetaldehyde. Acetaldehyde, or acetaldehyde, contains two carbons, and as we'll see, it's very, very significant in certain biological metabolic processes. We'll talk about it more even in this section. 
One last aldehyde that I'd like to show you is this structure. Notice that it's essentially a benzene ring with the aldehyde functional group attached to it. In fact, you might recognize it from when we talked about benzene and aromatic compounds. This is benz aldehyde. And benz aldehyde has two equally useful purposes. One is that it can be used in industrial processes, often as a solvent. That's not necessarily that interesting, but I find its second use more interesting. You actually might be eating or drinking benzaldehydes at some point today if you eat or drink anything that has almond flavoring. Almond's unique smell and flavor comes partly from benzaldehyde, so it finds equal uses in very industrial settings, but also in applications where you want to get an almond-like essence. In fact, on some ingredient bottles, when they list almond flavoring, what they actually could say is benzaldehyde. But enough about aldehydes for now. Let's talk about ketones. We've already seen that ketones contain the carbonyl bond with an R group on each side of the carbonyl carbon. That means it can't contain a hydrogen directly connected to the carbon Otherwise, it would be classified as an aldehyde. Ketones are similar to aldehydes in how we name them, with two notable differences. We'll still name the carbon chain, making sure that it contains the carbonyl bond, but we'll use a different ending. Ketones, as you might guess from the name, use the O-N-E ending, whereas aldehydes used the A-L ending. The other difference is that because the carbonyl bond could exist anywhere along the carbon backbone, we'll have to number its location, much the way that we number the location of a functional group like the alcohol functional group. Let's give it a try. Here's an example of a ketone. See if you can figure out what the IUPAC name of this molecule would be. With ketone molecules, Unlike with aldehydes, I can choose where to start numbering the backbone, and I want to do that to get the carbonyl carbon to the lowest position possible. So on this particular molecule, if I numbered from the left, the carbonyl carbon would be on the fourth carbon of the backbone. But if I number from the right, I'll see that that carbon ends up on the third carbon. So I'll number the backbone from the right. There's two equally correct ways to put this name together, and either one will be acceptable in this class. One would be to call this molecule 3 hexanone. Notice that I'm using hexane, but instead of an E, I end it with O-N-E, indicating that it's a ketone. And the 3 in front indicates that that's where the carbonyl bond of the ketone is located. I can also write it so that the three exists directly before the O-N-E prefix. Either one will be correct. Let's try one more example. Did you get the name of this molecule? Well, this is actually the same molecule, just written in a line structure. Again, I get to choose which way to number, and the way this one is drawn, it's better to number from the left side in order to get the carbonyl bond to the lowest position. So again, I could write the name of this molecule as 3-hexanone, or I could write it and say it as hexane-3-one. Either one is perfectly acceptable. There's really only one ketone that has a common name which I'd like you to remember, and it's the simplest ketone you can possibly draw. Now when we saw aldehydes, the simplest aldehyde had just one carbon, but with ketones, we have to have three carbons at least because we know we have to have a R group on each side of the carbonyl bond. So the simplest ketone actually contains three carbons. The IUPAC name of this molecule would be 2-propanone or propane-2-one, but it's far more commonly known as acetone. And you might be familiar with acetone as a paint thinner or fingernail polish remover. And what it does when it serves those purposes is it's just very good at dissolving other substances. Sometimes acetone is referred to as the universal solvent, 
And that's because it mixes very, very effectively both with aqueous solutions and with organic solutions. That's because it contains carbon, but it's also a polar molecule. Now let's talk about some of the chemical reactions for aldehydes and ketones. We're going to focus only on oxidation and reduction. Oxidation and reduction reactions are simplest when it comes to ketones. And in fact, we've already seen one of these. It was a reaction we learned about where ketones weren't the reactant, but rather the product. If you were to flip back in your notes to the section where we covered alcohol reactions, you might remember that if we oxidize a secondary alcohol using a substance such as chromate and sulfuric acid, we get a ketone. So ketones themselves are the product of oxidation by a secondary alcohol. But you might think about this as being the end of the line for ketone oxidation. If you keep mixing the ketone with more chromate or any other oxidizing agent, nothing will happen. So while secondary alcohols can be oxidized to make a ketone, a ketone can't be oxidized to make anything at all. No reaction occurs when you mix an oxidizing agent with a ketone. You can, however, do the reverse reaction, which is to say that if you take a ketone and you mix it with the opposite of an oxidizing agent, that would be a reducing agent, you can actually reverse the ketone reaction back to make a secondary alcohol. A very common reducing agent that we see in organic chemistry is a substance called lithium aluminum hydride, or LIALH4, mixed in the presence of water or acid, as I'll just represent with an H2O here. When a ketone is reduced using lithium aluminum hydride, you produce a secondary alcohol. So you can oxidize a secondary alcohol to make a ketone, whereas you can reduce a ketone to make a secondary alcohol. So to summarize, here's really the two reactions I'd like you to remember for ketones. The first is, you can try to oxidize a ketone, but nothing will happen. So don't be fooled by reactions that show a ketone mixed with an oxidizing agent. Whether that oxidizing agent is chromate or anything else, nothing will happen. You can, however, reduce a ketone. And the reducing agent we'll use for this class is lithium aluminum hydride in the presence of water. When you reduce a ketone using lithium aluminum hydride, you'll make a secondary alcohol. Exactly which one depends on what R groups were originally present on the ketone. Let's do a practice question. Draw the product that results when 2-butanone is reduced with lithium aluminum hydride in water. Pause the video and see if you can write out this reaction. In this question, I only asked for you to draw the product. But even for chemists, it's a little hard to draw the product before you've even seen the reactant. So first, let's take a second to draw out 2-butanone. You may have done this in condensed form or a line structure. Either one's fine, and I'll draw it both ways to make it easy. In condensed form, we know that 2-butanone, because it's a ketone, is going to have a carbonyl bond. This has to be on the second carbon of the molecule, which means that the rest of the structure would look like this. Four carbons linked together with the ketone on the second carbon. In a line structure, that would look like this. I put the carbonyl bond on the second carbon, or the first peak in this case. Then, if I reduce these molecules, whichever form you're more comfortable seeing it as, with lithium aluminum hydride in the presence of water, I'm going to form a secondary alcohol. The structure of that is simply made by taking your original ketone structure and changing it to an alcohol functional group. So if you're more comfortable seeing the condensed form, it might look like this. I'll keep the backbone the same, but I'm going to change the second carbon from containing a carbonyl bond to containing an OH group. That means that this carbon also has to have another hydrogen attached.
If I do that as a line structure, you might find it to be a little simpler because I don't have to draw in that additional hydrogen. If I name these products, you'll notice that the product is actually 2-butanol. So 2-butanone can be reduced to 2-butanol. This is a classic example of the reduction of a ketone. Now let's look at some of the oxidation and reduction reactions that are possible for aldehyde. And to do this, I again want to review a reaction that involved alcohols. We just saw, as we have previously this quarter, that a secondary alcohol can be oxidized to make a ketone. Well, we haven't actually learned a reaction already that makes aldehydes. We did, however, see that a primary alcohol can be oxidized to make a carboxylic acid. So the same chromate and sulfuric acid, when mixed with a primary alcohol, makes a carboxylic acid, whereas when it was mixed with a secondary alcohol, made a ketone. This, however, is not the whole story because you might recall that chromate and sulfuric acid is what we call a harsh oxidizing agent. So what's the difference between this harsh oxidizing agent and what we would refer to as a mild oxidizing agent? Well, the difference is whether you get a carboxylic acid as a product or whether you get an aldehyde. It's possible to oxidize a primary alcohol into an aldehyde by using a mild oxidizing agent. And one of the most classic examples is a compound called pyridinium chromate chloride, or PCC. Mixing the PCC oxidizing agent with a primary alcohol will give you an aldehyde, whereas mixing chromate, or another harsh oxidizing agent, with the primary alcohol gives you a carboxylic acid. It's almost as if the aldehyde is a halfway point in this reaction, except that by reacting it with PCC, you get it as a stable product. Now, if you were to take that aldehyde and continue to mix it with something harsher, you could turn it into a carboxylic acid. So harsh oxidizing agents, whether mixed with primary alcohols or aldehydes, always give us carboxylic acid. But it is possible to make an aldehyde by mixing a mild oxidizing agent, such as PCC, with a primary alcohol. One more thing. This reaction can be reversed. Let's not worry about the carboxylic acid part of it for now. Let's just focus on the aldehyde. We said that you can reduce a ketone to make a secondary alcohol. Well, the same thing is true with an aldehyde. You can reduce an aldehyde to make a primary alcohol. Again, we can use a reducing agent such as lithium aluminum hydride and water, and doing so will create a primary alcohol. So, we just saw three different reactions, one of which was actually reviewed from the alcohol chapter. Let's do a quick summary. For aldehydes, you can use a harsh oxidizing agent on them. The result of this is that you'll get a carboxylic acid. That's different from ketones, which can't be oxidized, no matter how harsh the oxidizing agent is. You can also reduce aldehydes. And when you do that, you basically create an alcohol from the same carbon backbone, which means you'll get a primary alcohol. In addition to these, you can also prepare an aldehyde by mixing PCC with a primary alcohol. Let's do a practice problem. In this example, you're given a molecule called propanal. We know that because it contains three carbons, and we know that the carbonyl bond must be on the first carbon. Take a second, pause the video, and see if you can write the products of these two different reactions. In the reaction on the top, we're doing a reduction. We know that because we're using lithium aluminum hydride, a pretty strong reducing agent. Reducing an aldehyde will give us a primary alcohol. So there's a couple different ways I can draw this. One way is to keep the backbone of the molecule the same and just change the carbonyl bond into an OH group. 
Notice that I need to keep the H drawn on that zigzag line to make sure it doesn't turn into a carbon. However, if I want to leave it off, I might draw something like this. It's really the same molecule. Either one of those would be completely correct. If you didn't already, pause the video and try drawing the product of the bottom reaction. The bottom reaction is an example of a harsh oxidation. Oxidizing an aldehyde gives us a carboxylic acid. It basically creates an extra oxygen where the carbon and the hydrogen are directly bonded together in the reactant. So again, I can start by drawing the same backbone. This time I'll keep the carbonyl bond, but I'll add an OH group. Be sure to do lots of examples of these reactions. There's plenty of problems in the textbook as well as on our website. One last thing about aldehydes and ketones. Because they are so similar to each other structurally and share many similar physical properties, sometimes it can be difficult to differentiate between the two molecules in a laboratory. Let's say, for instance, you have a product and you're not sure if you formed an aldehyde or a ketone. There's a couple different ways you could tell the difference. One is to use what's usually referred to as oxidation testing. Oxidation testing takes advantage of the fact that ketones cannot be oxidized, whereas aldehydes can. And you can, of course, do this testing with any oxidizing agent, but we often like to use ones that give a very clear visual indication of whether or not a reaction has happened. One of the favorites of scientists and science students alike is what's called Tollens reagent. Tollens reagent is actually a silver oxidizing agent, and it's silver in the sense that it actually contains silver atoms. Those silver atoms will only be reduced into their elemental form if an oxidation occurs. Remember, ketones cannot be oxidized. So if you take a substance that contains a ketone and mix it with Tollens reagent, frankly, nothing happens. So if you start out with something clear and colorless and mix it with Tollens reagent, if that something is a ketone, nothing's going to happen. No color, no change. But if I take a substance that contains an aldehyde and mix it with a Tollens reagent, now oxidation will occur. And during the oxidation process, Tollens reagent will actually release silver atoms. The consequence is that the test tube in which you do the reaction forms a silver mirror-like effect. That silver is literally silver atoms that have been reduced while the aldehyde was oxidized. So by adding Tollens reagent to a solution, you can differentiate between whether the solution contains a ketone or an aldehyde. And that's one reason that people like it. Another one that was very commonly used for a long time in biomedical labs is something called Benedict's reagent. Benedict's reagent gives a more colorful result than Tollens reagent. The Benedict's reagent itself is a clear blue solution. So if you mix Benedict's reagent with a ketone, nothing happens and it stays clear and blue. But if you mix Benedict's reagent with an aldehyde, we start to see an interesting oxidation reaction. And depending on how much aldehyde is present, the reaction mixture will start to turn cloudy and that blue color will start to go green. Depending on how much aldehyde is present, it might go beyond green to start turning into orange or even bright red. So this colored precipitate indicates that an aldehyde was present. Benedict's reagent was used for a long time in biomedical labs as a way to test specimens such as human urine for the presence of aldehydes. And you'll see if you go into Chem 123 why that can have such interesting physiological ramifications. These days, of course, we usually have more technical ways of measuring it, but Benedict's reagent was a favorite of many scientists for a long time. There's one other way that you can effectively differentiate between aldehydes and ketones in our laboratory, and that's using infrared spectroscopy. Because aldehydes and ketones have similarities in their structure, they generally give 
fairly similar spectra with one notable, noticeable difference. Here, for example, is an aldehyde spectrum, and here's an example of a ketone spectrum. What I'd like to draw your attention to are two individual peaks. One is the peak that's around 1700. This is the carbonyl peak that's caused by a carbon double bonded to an oxygen. Both aldehydes and ketones contain this structural element, so we expect this to show up on both of their spectra. Notice, however, what's different about the carbon-hydrogen single bond peak, which occurs just below 3000. On the aldehyde spectrum, notice that this peak is split into two, almost like two fangs or claws. Those two fangs, as I like to call them, are a strong indication of an aldehyde for reasons that have to do with the carbon directly bonded to a hydrogen on the carbonyl atom. On ketones, you're very unlikely to see that peak split in half. So sometimes you'll see a weak peak, sometimes you'll see a strong peak, but usually it won't have this nice symmetry. Looking for that double fang is a good way of differentiating between aldehydes and ketones.